The RCMP maintains a list of, quote, high-risk individuals. As of last week, there were 93 names on it. Martin Couture-Rouleau, who killed warrant officer Patrice Vincent in Quebec, was on it. Michael zehaf Bibo, the Ottawa shooter, apparently was not. The RCMP admits surveilling all 93 suspects on that list would exhaust its resources. And so, to help us understand why security is neither obvious, cheap, nor foolproof, we welcome, in our nation's capital via Skype, Michael Geist, Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-Commerce Law at the University of Ottawa. Also on Skype from Ottawa, Wesley Wark, Visiting Research Professor in the University of Ottawa's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. And with us here in studio, Mubin Sheikh, former CSIS and RCMP operative, Hugh Siegel, former Canadian Senator, now the Master at Massey College at U of T, and Veronica Kitchen, professor, uh, professor rather of political science at the University of Waterloo and in the Balsillie School of International Affairs. And we welcome you two guests out of town. We welcome our guests here in the studio. And if I may offer just a particular and special welcome to you, Hugh Siegel. Many people don't know you recently underwent a brain operation for a subdural hematoma and you are recovering nicely, and you look great, and we're happy to see you back on your feet. Well, I'm glad to be anywhere, actually, these days, <laughs> and I want to express my deep appreciation to the good folks at St. Michael's Hospital who did a marvelous job. Here, here. Wesley Wark, let's get you into this. What was your reaction to the RCMP's claim that they haven't got the resources to keep an eye on 93 high-risk people? Well, it was an interesting response, and, and Bob Paulson, as RCMP commissioner, is, if, if nothing else, uh, very forthright, which is a welcome change, I think, in the culture of the RCMP. Um, what he said, I think, is not surprising. There, you know, no law enforcement or security agency is ever going to have uh, all the resources it needs to co cover all the threats it has to cover. Uh, the, the question in, in these cases is whether it has uh, enough resources to do the job in terms of both intelligence collection and something that doesn't uh, get as much attention as it should, which is the business of analyzing the intelligence when it comes in. No good just having the, the information if you can't really make sense of it. And, and one of the critical issues, I think, that, is, that has arisen, certainly in the case of the, uh, the Quebec attack, uh, is that at, at a point not long before um, that attack occurred, the RCMP came to the conclusion that uh, Monsieur Couture Rouleau uh, did not present an imminent threat and appeared to be changing his ways and his um, uh, ways of thinking. So that raises the possibility, it's too soon to tell for sure, that there was really an intelligence failure there. They got close to him, but misunderstood at the end of the day what his intentions <laughs> were. Mubin Sheikh, you've had a lot of experience dealing with these intelligence services. In a country of 36 million people, does it make sense to you that they can't keep an eye on 93? It does make uh, some sense. I mean, um, with 90 individuals, really, truly, the only way you're going to avoid somebody who's low risk uh, from suddenly being the high risk guy is to monitor them 24-7. And uh, how are you going to do that? The RCMP is a small police force. They're not a large police force. Uh, maybe some suggestions would be to pull in people from maybe seconded from other police services maybe even, uh, quote-unquote, re-enlist uh, Canadian Forces members who have theater experience, surveillance, they know what they're doing, uh, instead of hiring new officers, putting them through new training. You know, so there, there are solutions on, on, on the books. Hugh Siegel, when you were in the Senate, did you have a good understanding of the fact that the RCMP was unable to keep an eye on these 93? Well, we had hearings on homegrown terrorism and our capacity to respond as a system. Uh, one of our guests, Wesley Wark, was one of the... Uh, people who testified before that committee. When was that? Uh, that would have been in 2010, 2011. Okay. And we made some recommendations as a committee, some of which have been taken up. One of them, and it deals with the manpower issue directly, was that we should be making changes to Section 10 of the CSIS Act, which is the law that indicates what CSIS officers do, to add to the analytical and surveillance and all that reporting process which they do, which they then transmit to the police, if they find something of substance, to give them the ability to engage in lawful disruption. Now, lawful disruption is a legal term that has specifics to it. It's governed by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But it means that if a CSIS agent sees something happening that is problematic and that he or she has a way of disrupting that activity without breaking the law, they should have the statutory capacity to do so. That would add to the forces that are now available to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And as the commissioner said, when I think a fellow journalist said to him, you know, you're going to put 250 people on this case now. And he said, yes, and I have to decide, do I take them 
from tax enforcement? Do I take them from corporate corruption? Do I take them from the drug detail? Where do I take them from? I think the answer is yes, isn't it? Well, I think the answer is yes, but he has these other ongoing mandates, hmm. uh, which may raise the larger question of whether we're asking the RCMP, because it also does provincial policing work in hmm. eight of our ten provinces, whether the burden is too, too large if the national security side is increasing. Just curious, you made recommendations as a Senate committee. What happened to those recommendations? Not much. Um, and the committee was not, re was, was not recontinued. Uh, in 2012, the government decided that they didn't need to have that committee. The matters could be addressed in other areas. What it raises in terms of legislation that may in fact be introduced or may have been already introduced, where is that committee, where is that legislation going to go when it reaches the Senate? Will it go to the Justice and uh, Constitutional Affairs, which will mean there will be a lot of discussion about the Charter, or will it go to the Defense and National Security Committee? Either way, there will be Charter challenge issues which emerge as there were when Jean Chrétien brought in legislation after 9-1-1, where the government of the day thought it would be charter-proof, and in fact the courts indicated on many occasions it was not charter-proof, and part of what our committee had to do, in fact, was to revise that legislation to make it charter-proof and to make it consistent with court decisions. Veronica Kitchen, what does all of this tell you about the state of our counter-terrorist apparatus in this country? I think we need to remember that we're always going to have to set priorities. Uh, we'll never have enough resources to do everything that police and intelligence services want us to do. And in fact, I think we should always um, be a bit careful uh, to do some, some checking before we take requests for more resources at face value. I've, n I've never met a bureaucracy that didn't want more resources, for instance. Uh, and as Wesley said, the more data you have, the more data you have to analyze. And in fact, it may get harder and harder uh, to find the needle in the haystack. Or as in the case of Zahaf Bibo, the needle might not be in the haystack at all. Right. Michael Geist, I don't want to oversimplify this, but does it not make sense on the face of it that we ought to have fewer people in the security business worrying about who's illegally Xeroxing some textbook and more focused on breaking up terrorist acts in the country? Well, I do think at times we've had some misplaced priorities. And as we've already heard, that becomes, I think, one of the key things you need to think about. Where do your priority, priorities lie and recognize there aren't unlimited resources? The concern that I often have coming at this from a law professor's perspective is that what seems to happen quickly is when you don't have enough resources or you recognize there are uh, there are a finite amount of resources, the next best solution, according to some, is to just create more laws. And so they say, well, we may not have enough resources to deal with, do what we can right now. What we also need is more powers. And it's that shift to more powers at a time when often we can't even make use of the powers we have right now, plus the kind of unintended consequences that can arise when you have a rush to move to new legislation that I think should give us some pause. Well, the Prime Minister, the day after all of this Ottawa tragedy happened, uh, certainly in those extraordinary speeches that were given on the floor of the House of Commons, uh, gave us a hint as to his thinking that day. Let's play a clip from that and then we'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please. Last week, our government proposed amendments to the legislation under which the Canadian, intelligence, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service operates. And as you know, Mr. Speaker, in recent weeks, I have been saying that our laws and police powers need to be strengthened in the area of surveillance, detention and arrest. They need to be much strengthened. And I assure you, Mr. Speaker, that work, which is already underway, will be expedited. Michael Geist, much strengthened is what the Prime Minister said last week. What's your view on that? He did, and that sounds like a rush to move to more legislation. We may see some today, and we and there is a signal that we may see other legislation that even goes beyond the bounds of what the government was initially thinking. And, and I think we ought to recognize that's happening without having really taken stock of exactly what happened, where the, the failures or where the places we can make changes are from, from what took place last week are. And so some of the issues that arise have, in all likelihood, very little to do with putting in new legislation. And even the new legislation that, that as I say, may be forthcoming uh, as soon as today, uh, don't necessarily deal with the kinds of issues that arose uh, last week. And so uh, this certainly provides a convenient cover. We've seen that in the case of many other countries where one of the responses you get in, in the aftermath of the shock of these kinds of attacks is to move forward with new kinds of surveillance legislation to say that our laws aren't tough enough. But what we have also learned, I think, in the years, particularly since 9-11, 
is that unintended consequences do happen. Misuses, despite the best of intentions, do happen as well. And that having some sort of pause to take stock both of what happened and how it can be addressed is absolutely critical to ensuring that you maintain uh, a good balance when it comes to having the effectiveness of the law, but at the same time, uh, considering privacy and civil liberties as much as possible. Wesley Work, I wonder if it's worth pointing out, though, that even before the events in the nation's capital happened last Wednesday, I think, ironically, on that very day, Parliament was going to be considering the introduction of new powers that were already in the pipeline. The plan was already to introduce those in advance of anything happening. Is that worth pointing out? Well, that's correct, absolutely, Steve. And, and the uh, public safety minister, Stephen Blaney, uh, subsequently said in a radio interview that he was frustrated uh, that he wasn't able to present that legislation uh, this past week to uh, the House of Commons. That legislation, uh, we've been given various kind of teasing pronouncements about and seen kind of official unauthorized leaks about, but we've, of course, never seen the details. It seems to be simply re legislation focused on some revisions to the CESIS Act governing the operations of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Uh, where the government now stands on this, uh, it seems to me very unclear. There's both a suggestion that they're going to go ahead with that originally intended legislation, plus, as your clip from the Prime Minister suggests, they're thinking uh, further down the road of more extensive changes. You know, and I would say if it's down the road and subject to you know, really proper thought and examination, why not open up? Uh, the whole range of um, anti-terrorism legislation and practices that we've engaged in in Canada since 9-11. It's 13 years since we passed the original Anti-Terrorism Act. Uh, some of the legislation surrounding our intelligence agencies, including CSIS and the RCMP, goes a long way further back than that. So, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't have to wait to take advantage of uh, tragic events like occurred last week. But there is, I think, we should recognize an opportunity here to revisit what we have done. That's not necessary to say uh, at all that we need new stringent laws, but no doubt there's a lot of fine tuning that, that could occur. And there are problems with the acts that surround our, our the legislate for our intelligence agencies, that's yeah. for sure. Mubin, as you look at it, does it feel to you as if the Parliament of Canada and our law enforcement agencies new, need new resources and new powers to do the job that apparently we want them to do. Well, when we talk about new resources versus new powers, um, resources they do need more of. Uh, that's, I think, obvious. Uh, and we talked, to, I, I indicated a little bit about that, maybe increasing manpower, not necessarily hiring more people, but at least uh, augmenting services of surveillance and whatnot. Uh, as for um, new laws, I think we, we have laws good enough. Uh, preventive detention, investigative hearing, these are things that are already on paper. Uh, maybe will be revived, I'm sure, and um, you know, for what it's worth, I do support that. Uh, these are tools that have not been used, um, and we've been very judicious um, in the use of the ones that we do have on, on, the, on the books, so maybe it's time now to roll out uh, those two aspects of it. What's your view on that, Hugh Siegel? Oh, I think Wesley Wark is on to something um, in terms of dealing with how old some of our legislation is and how out of sync it is with reality on the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, our national security advisor, the senior national security advisor to the prime minister, Steve Rigby, who's a wonderful, hardworking, I think very competent individual, is not governed by any statute. There's no law that defines his authority or his powers. There's no law that defines his capacity to make other parts of government share information with each other that may be vital. There's no law that allows him to ask other police forces to provide information to each other. So how does he know what to do? Well, he's a very competent person and he's working based on a series of or how uh, broad his powers are. How does he know? Well, his powers are not terribly broad, but there's no statutory base. Hmm. And, and we had, in front of our committee, um, we had the police forces of Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal all agree that a statutory requirement to share criminal intelligence about these sorts of problems on a real-time basis would be of huge value to them. And even our friends from the Montreal Police Force were not troubled by any constitutional issues. They thought hmm. That would be a good thing for them if Vancouver had to share information, and they had to share information with Vancouver. There's a statute to make that real. They'd be delighted. So there's a lot of ability here to improve the sharing of information without impeding people's rights 
and, and the, the whole question of the presumption of innocence, which is a fundamental part of our Magna Carta-based mm -hmm. legal system. Veronica Kitchen, why would they not be sharing information at this point? Um, well, in some cases they are sharing information, of course, and in some cases um, police forces in local jurisdictions, so provincial or municipal police forces, are integrated into the RCMP's national security enforcement teams. And so in some cases that is an opportunity for the RCMP to task extra resources because uh, they can, if, if the integrated officer is senior enough, they can task the resources of their home police hmm. force. Uh, that also makes it easier for them to directly access databases. But in, in some cases, you know, they don't know who to call. Um, it's not clear how to, to communicate across those lines. Um, people are not necessarily trained in national security in uh, provincial and local police forces and so don't necessarily know what they're looking for. Do you know how much sharing goes on among forces with other countries? There is certainly uh, some sharing um, with forces in other countries and I think that's one of the things we need to be particularly careful about. Um, certainly the mayor or our case has taught us that you need to be careful about how you share information and what kind of caveats you attach to information that is shared mm -hmm. and together with improving information sharing making sure that the oversight mechanisms and mechanisms for correcting errors as they happen keep up with the technology and keep up with changing legislation about sharing. We have had in Canada since 911 something called ITAC, the Integrated Terrorism Analysis Center, which is based in CSIS and it brings people together from all the services and they connect with the five eyes and our allies around the world. Just tell everybody what the five eyes the is. The five eyes are the United States, Australia, United Kingdom, New Zealand, Canada, who share intelligence on a regular basis. Um, so it's a little larger, if you wish, because it goes beyond NATO, because New Zealand and Australia are not in NATO. We have that, plus the NATO nets. ITAC is able to look at all that information and share it within the government and get information from the government and share it abroad under the statutory provisions that exist. It's not a deep organization. It doesn't have a lot of staff. It has very competent, hardworking staff. But it's not as deep as one might think necessary under our present circumstance. Hmm. Let's uh, play another clip now. Prime Minister Harper also discussed uh, in an interview with the Wall Street Journal about the need for surveillance. We'll hear what he had to say and then come back and chat. Roll tape, please. How do you get that balance right between, between on the one hand, you know, protecting the security of your people and preserving their, their, their right to go about their lives? Well, I, I think broadly the answer to that's actually quite straightforward, which is that um, you focus your energies, you have a, uh, obviously a, a system that can identify uh, potential threats, track them, and zero in on surveillance on those particular threats, as opposed to systems that are just broadly based on widespread surveillance of everyone. I'm not a big believer in those kinds of systems, not just because they have the potential to infringe civil liberty, but they usually overwhelm you with data in a way that you can't actually process or make any use of. So the, the real uh, challenge, I think, is using these tools and using them in a way that you can focus in on the people you know are actually uh, you know, going, down, uh, going down the wrong path. Michael Geist, how reassured or not are you by that answer? I'm not reassured at all. I mean, there's a certain irony that Prime Minister's talking about an issue that in a post-Snowden environment, many in Canada have been desperately calling for some discussion on and, and more information and, and transparency on, and yet, you know, the remarks come to a business audience in the United States instead. Um, I think there is a, there remains a strong sense that the precise kind of surveillance that the Prime Minister says he doesn't think is particularly effective is one that we are uh, a close co we closely cooperate on with the NSA. That's certainly some of the things that we've seen come out of some of the Snowden revelations. Uh, and so there is already a sense that we do capture a lot. I mean, questions still today around metadata, how much of it is collected, the mandate under that under on which that takes place, and the utter lack of or concerns around the lack of accountability uh, and transparency associated with those programs really stands in strong juxtaposition with the Prime Minister who, who says, well, listen, I don't think that's a particularly effective approach. I think we need to know far more um, in a much more open manner about some of the things that we're doing. That's not the information itself, but rather the practices. And then if the Prime Minister is talking about engaging in more targeted, directed surveillance, 
uh, then let's identify whether or not the rules we have in place right now are sufficient. We know just quickly that the, the legislation that the government's looking to change with respect to CSIS today really isn't about information sharing as much as it is uh, CSIS and CSEC having, in a sense, misled the courts when they were looking for cooperation from some of their counterparts elsewhere. Having said all that, uh, Wesley Wark, he did mention concern about civil liberties being infringed upon, and he did, maybe I'm reading between the lines here, but he did seem to say that these fishing expeditions using metadata are not, in his view, all that effective, and therefore he didn't seem particularly um, interested in that aspect of it. Am I reading too much into that? Well, it, it's hard to know what exactly to read into it, Steve. I mean, uh, it's interesting to hear the Prime Minister of Canada issue basically a kind of anti-NSA message, uh, NSA standing for the National Security Agency, which is, which is this global giant that does do mass surveillance, both of, of United States telecommunications and, and global ones. I, th I think it, it is reasonable to say that the Canadian agencies themselves, including CSE, do not do that kind of mass bulk surveillance. Nevertheless, we know, as, as Michael has indicated, that CSE, for example, does metadata collection on some kind of scale. How they do it exactly and why they do it and how effective they do it are all important questions that, that we do not have answers for. Uh, the CSE uh, chief, as he's called, uh, did say that they, they have to do that kind of metadata collection in order to properly target um, uh, people for surveillance and, and properly identify threats. So you need one to move to the other. Um, but it's, it's very difficult to know how well the Canadian system actually works in that regard. And this is, this is one of the problems we have, I think, broadly with the regime that we've established for accountability of intelligence and security in Canada, which, which was established uh, with the notion that the principal thing you had to deal with with regard to security and intelligence agencies was the possibility that they would abuse their powers and engage in unlawful activities. And that was really a, a direct result of, of some of these sort of scandals we saw in, in our past. What that um, review regime has never really tackled is the question of performance. Just how good are the security intelligence agencies at their task and how good are they at, at shifting when the, th when the threat environment changes? So we spend a lot of time on the issue of lawfulness and not enough time on the issue of what is often called efficacy or simply performance. But one of the things we're trying to figure out, Hugh Siegel, on this program is where where you find that balance. Obviously, given the events of last week, there will be more people in the country, presumably than the week before, who are scared sure. about their safety. Uh, there are certainly, to be sure, a, a large group of people in the country who are worried that we don't react too quickly and pass laws that infringe too much on our civil rights. Of all the people on this program, fair to say you know the Prime Minister better than anybody. Where do you think his chief commitment lies on this issue? I think his, his, his uh, commitment is about trying to find the right balance, but like any prime minister in this kind of circumstance where there are changing events, you can't know exactly where that point is. Where I think he has been, and I say this with great respect, wrong, as have been his ministers for the last while, is not embracing the instrument used by every single one of our NATO partners, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Belgium, Italy, all of them have statutory legislative oversight of their national security services. Discreet, sworn to secrecy, but that's where questions on performance can be asked. That's where the heads of the agencies can say, we don't have enough resources, or we're making choices between these kinds of threats. What is your view about where those choices should be made? They don't want operational help from legislators, but they do want some broad frame of people who worked in the area for some time. Why do you think we, not have, we don't have it? I don't know the answer. I think it is largely because, um, let me just say this, the heads of the agencies who have appeared before the National Defense and Security Committee have been asked the question, and they've all said, if structured prudently, we think these would be assets to the way in which we do security in this country. So at some political level in the Privy Council office or perhaps amongst some ministers, the notion of another accountability is seen to be problematic and a waste of time. And they think that that CERC, which was set up for the reasons, the Security Intelligence Review Committee of former formers, parliamentarians, distinguished Canadians all, usually, um, was established for the purpose of dealing with what Wesley Wark said it's supposed to deal with. It doesn't really have the capacity to deal with the broader question of performance, future plans, strategy, 
Every other NATO partner has a legislative process that does it. We do not, and I think we're going to find that is a serious deficiency, both in the debate on new legislation and in the general reaction to the of the country to any fresh ideas that are put in place to protect people, because people have the right to ask the question, mm -hmm. how will that protect us better? Let us understand. And the problem is the heads of the agencies, when they appear before parliamentary committees, they cannot disclose everything they know. By virtue of the Secrets Act, they have a higher level of clearance than the committees before which they appear. Therefore, they will never lie. I think they do their best to tell as much of the truth as they're allowed to. But the statute says they can't tell the whole truth because they have to maintain some confidentiality in defense of national security. That sets us apart from all of our NATO colleagues who actually have a process by which these matters can be discussed in a discreet fashion by parliamentarians, legislators, British House of Lords, and all the rest who get it done. Hmm. We can't do that in this country. I don't know this for sure, Michael Geist, but I'm guessing that the Prime Minister hasn't put this statutory legislative oversight in place because he may not, for good reason, trust people on the Hill to keep their mouths quiet. Uh, leaking is a part of the problem. And is it possible that he just doesn't think that people are going to be trustworthy enough to keep those secrets? I don't know. I mean, listen, leaks come from, from any number of sources. We saw that just last week where uh, the photograph of the, of the shooter uh, was one taken by a tourist, sent out to some police forces, and then ultimately leaked out uh, and made its way onto Twitter within a number of hours. And so if the concern is a mistrust of parliamentarians, I mean, that, I think that speaks to a, a pretty serious issue. I must admit, I'm not, I'm not convinced that that's what it necessarily is. Instead, I think it is a concern that this will become a politicized process in the way that so many other things have become politicized in recent times. It seems to me that you know the, the fact that, that all our parliamentarians stood together and stood facing a, a similar threat just last week points to the need for to, to move towards a, a nonpartisan approach on this. This is something that is, of course, critically important to all Canadians. And surely, as, 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 as Hugh Siegel notes, the fact that so many other countries have found a way to do it, to bring in the kind of oversight and accountability uh, that we haven't been able to do, uh, speaks to a, a shortcoming in our system and you know, concerns or suggestions that somehow some of this information like, might leak out, I don't think really stand up to much scrutiny. Okay. You want to come yeah, back the at British that? The committee has been operating for over two decades. It started under Mrs. Thatcher. It has members of the Lords who are former chiefs of the defense staff and senior police officers with Scotland Yard. It has MPs who are ministers of internal affairs under the Labour administration. They have not had one single leak in two decades. And they meet every week on these issues with agency heads in a constructive fashion. If they can do it, and that is not a parliament known for being completely discreet, I think we can manage it here. <laughs> that's, that's such a nice way to put it, not completely discreet. Yes, indeed. Steve, uh, can I? Just yes, please, Wesley, come on in. Very briefly. I mean, uh, Hugh Siegel w was too modest to say that while he was still a senator, and, and certainly I think many of us regret the fact that he is no longer in that distinguished chamber, he and his colleague Romeo Dallaire, also now a former senator, put forward what I think of as an excellent uh, proposed piece of legislation precisely uh, around the issue of creating a legislative body. Um, through statute in, in the House of Commons and the Senate that would deal very broadly with security and intelligence issues. Uh, and as, as Hugh Siegel says, the government has not taken this up. It hasn't taken the opportunity of either his bill or a bill put forward by Wayne Easter or a current bill going through second reading put forward by the, the Liberal uh, defense critic, Joyce Murray. So there are lots of opportunities on the table at least to have a proper parliamentary discussion about this. But but as uh, Hugh knows well, the government is very reluctant to do that. Hmm. Veronica Kitchen, I want to get you to react first to this quote I'm going to read here. This is something that uh, Michael Zehaf Bibo is said to have said a few years ago uh, in describing his own predicament. He said, I'm a crack addict, and at the same time, I'm a religious person. So I want to sacrifice freedom and good things for a year, maybe, so when I come out, I'll appreciate the things of life more and be clean. I don't want to be released. The police said they couldn't keep me, so I went to do a crime to come to jail. So if you release me, what's going to happen again? Probably the same loop, and I'm going to be right back here again. Talk about prophetic. All right, the, the debate percolating through the media right now, through much of society now, is how to view the perpetrators of last week's events. I'll just keep it generic like that. In your view, are these two men with serious mental health issues who are lone wolves, renegades to society, that kind of thing? 
or are these people more better, better described as people who killed for a particular ism, a particular ideology? What's your take? I mean, I, I think clearly both. I think clearly they have uh, mental health issues, and clearly we have seen several of these lone actor terrorists with mental health issues. But there's clearly also something about um, this particular uh, radical ideology and other ra radical ideologies that are very attractive to particularly young men uh, who are looking to commit violence. And I think we do ourselves a disservice if we look at the uh, an individual who has been attracted by a radical jihadist ideology in isolation from those who have been attracted by misogynist or right-wing ideologies. We don't have a lot of data points uh, in any case on these lone actors, and so I see more similarities than I do differences between these individuals, school shooters, uh, Anders Breivik, uh, work similar similar kinds of actors and if we're really going to understand what's going on here I think we need to look at them as part of the same phenomena just uh, filling in some gaps there Breivik was the the man in Norway, Norway who killed 77 people mm -hmm. uh, Bork I think is in court today uh, down east on the mm -hmm. issue of killing three RCMP officials uh, where do you come down on? obviously there's a continuum here at one end of the continuum is they did it all for Islamic fundamentalism and the other end of the continuum is they're just mental health problems and so on. Where are they, in your view, on that continuum? Yeah, I, I echo um, Professor Kitchen's um, viewpoint that really when you look at radicalization, uh, it's a process where a person starts from A and ends at B. And if B is committing violence, then you have to look at what uh, precipitated the violence. What, what other background factors, environmental, psychosocial factors, um, whether personality disorders or full-blown pathology, uh, these are all things to take into consideration, but definitely there is a, a point about the ideology. I mean, that particular ideology resonated with those two individuals. Uh, and for whatever reason, I mean, you have lone, uh, lone actors and you have known actors. So Zihaf Bibo was the lone actor. He really was in that sense. I mean, he fits the quote-unquote profile uh, in the sense that he's really messed up, drug issues, you know, he's just ready to pop. Uh, but the known actor, um, yeah, Martin uh, uh, Coteau-Rouleau, I mean, he, you know, he, was, he wasn't that. I mean, he was having problems in his life, but you know, he had converted. And he was really um, participating in that ideological narrative and part of that network. So, so uh, really, at the end of it, you have to look at you know, why is it that they came to that particular ideology. It could be a cultural thing in the sense that you know, he, he had uh, acquaintances that introduced him to it. But when you do look at you know, white supremacist ideology and other ideologies, these are people who are taking it from their particular culture. Um, so again, it really is the same kind of phenomenon with specific um, flavors, if you will. Hugh Siegel, let me tweak the question a bit, a bit more. Again, on a day when Bork is in court in New Brunswick on the issue of killing three RCMP officers, he said because he was, a, I guess, a libertarian, anti-government, whatever, not. Uh, am I allowed to say that? Well, I just did. Okay. And on the other hand, you've got these two others, recent converts to Islam, who claim to be doing what they're doing in the name of, uh, you know, the caliphate and that business. Should the reasons why they did their dastardly deeds make a difference in how we gauge the nature of the threat they represent? Well, motivation is very important. And of course, if you're dealing with somebody who's mentally unhinged, being predictive about motivation is problematic. Mm -hmm. I think all we can do as a society, um, aside from trying to make sure that we have enough resources in the communities to spot these folks early on, and to be fair, in a couple of circumstances in the past, parents or others have called the RCM police and said, I think we have a problem. Mm -hmm. And the RCM police have done their very best to respond as quickly as they could, but they don't have the capacity to turn on a dime, sadly. Um, what we heard from the Montreal, Vancouver, Toronto police, what we read in testimony from the New York police intelligence anti-terrorist people is that the stimuli that come to these usually young men who are a bit unhinged, often living a pretty, pretty singular life by themselves, mm -hmm. having a series of setbacks in their lives for a whole bunch of reasons, which doesn't, by the way, constitute an excuse at all for violence, is that what they see on the web 
what, it, what attracts them, what engages them with this being as a way, a way another way of acting out hmm. is really pretty serious. And if we as a society say certain things like child pornography are illegal in terms of broad distribution, we said in the committee we should be giving some thought as to whether there is a class of material, not that says, you know, um, we disagree with what the Israelis have done in Gaza or we disagree with Canada's foreign policy. That's legitimate public debate and discussion. But then says, and the way for you as an individual to express your opposition mm -hmm. is to go blow up a local Sunni mosque or to go blow up a synagogue or to go blow up a police station. That crosses a line. And that is something we have to deal with in terms of what's allowed on the web, what's deemed to be legal and appropriate. And I know people are going to say, you can't have any constraint on free thought and free expression. I agree with that. But you have to have a balance between freedom and order to really maintain, maintain um, freedom from fear and freedom from want. And both of those are fundamental to a democratic society. Michael Geist, you're the internet expert here. Is the balance out of whack in terms of what people can get access to on the internet, which may indeed fuel their unhinged terrorist activities? Well, I mean, there's no doubt that there's materials online that, that give, you know, that, that there are some cause for concern. The, the issue is whether or not legislatively a single country, a country like Canada, can do a whole lot about it. I mean, we've seen efforts, let's say, in the child pornography area uh, to try to limit access and, and clearly make that form of speech, so to speak, illegal. Uh, and yet we know that the ability to access that, whether from within the country or very often from without, uh, is still there. To create a framework where we make that kind of class of speech illegal and speech that I think by its nature becomes very, very difficult to define raises a whole series of challenges and problems in its own right. We saw it in the hate speech context, which is why some of the same people who may now be advocating um, to move on this kind of issue, on so terror-related speech, have in the past had real concerns around hate-related speech. They said, listen, uh, we can see how there can be real misuse in this context, never leaving aside the effectiveness of this when we know so much of the speech comes from elsewhere. And so it's one of those things where I mean, it's tempting to say the problem is the web, and so let's do something about it. I think in reality, though, um, the ability for some of these kinds of people who, as we've heard, have so many different social issues and other kinds of drug issues and the like, to, to think that somehow we can just shut off the tap with respect to the Internet and some of these kinds of outcomes, and they're, they're few and far between, but when they happen, they're terrible. To think that we can stop that from happening uh, by pr bringing new legislation to try to govern or police some of the things on the Internet strikes me as incredibly unlikely. Well, with about 10 minutes to go here, let me read something that Andrew Coyne wrote in the National Post uh, just a couple of days ago, and then, uh, well, I guess it's about five days ago now, and then get into uh, some discussion about whether we're into a new normal here. And we may just have to accept, as he calls it, the price for being alive today. Uh, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up this quote. We cannot stop every attack, and we shouldn't try, not only for the astronomic monetary cost entailed, but more for the cost to our national spirit. The risk that any one of us will be killed approaches zero, but the risk that some of us will be approaches a certainty. Very well, let us brace ourselves to it and adapt as Londoners adapted during the IRA years. As it is, we live with the reality that a certain number of murders will take place every year or a certain number of traffic deaths. We can live with this. Let's go around on this. Moving shape, do you agree? I do agree. Um, we're not going to stop everyone. We're not going to save everyone. Uh, like you mentioned, murders happen, traffic deaths happen, people die in skydiving accidents. Uh, these things will happen and will continue to happen, unfortunately. Hugh I mean, Siegel. I think uh, per perspective here, Steve, is very important. We're going to lose 20,000 North Americans to the flu in the next five months. 20,000 human beings. Is it preventable? Should we be doing more? We worry about Ebola, where we're dealing with maybe 10 people in all of North America, max. So I think we do have to keep some sense of perspective. That being said, every state's primary responsibility is to keep its population as safe as possible. So it's not, can we stop everything? Are we doing all we can to stop the more serious threats and keep them manageable over time? I How think do you that's the that core question? question. I think Canada has been doing a reasonably good job. I think part of the quality of life in this country is the balance that allows us to go about our lives day to day without fearing violence or random violence. We may have to move things up a touch based on the present risk context that exists because of 
the nature of ISIS, the, because of the nature of our allied commitment to try and stop the horrific things they are doing abroad to innocent civilians. But I don't know that we have to change the nature of our society to do that. I think, if anything, we have to say, how do we preserve the best of our society, the best of the balance, while doing what's necessary and what is appropriate to diminish risk as much as we can? I think Coyne's point is spot on. Veronica Kitchen, on, on Andrew Coyne's point, that we're into a new normal here and we may just have to accept some of this every now and then. I think it's absolutely true. There's no such thing as perfect security. And I also think it's important to remember that we have been living with this for a long time. This, this is not, certainly not the first terrorist attack in Canada or that affected Canadians. Uh, certainly not the, the first time uh, an actor influenced by a radical ideology of, of a certain flavor has um, attacked a Canadian or Canadians. Um, so we have been living with it, and I think, by and large, we should also remember that the police have disrupted uh, or stopped a lot of uh, attacks in, in the, the decade and a half since September 11th alone. Well, let's go back even further, because I, I think your earlier comment refers to the fact that, where are we now, is it 44 years ago the FLQ uh, did Abs what it yeah. did in the province of Quebec? Precisely. But, the, but, but with the benefit of hindsight now, there is a great deal of public opinion that suggests that the authorities really overreached in their efforts to deal with that mm -hmm. apprehended insurrection, as it was then called by the Prime Minister, and ended up putting, what was it, 500 people in jail who ought not to have been put in jail? Who were never charged. Who were never charged. And I think we learn every time. I mean, we, we overreacted to the FLQ crisis, but in the Air India attack, there were clearly um, problems with the way intelligence was collected and analyzed and turned into evidence and acted upon. Uh, you know, we've learned from 9-11, we've learned, learned from watching our, our allies, and I think it's just a, a process of learning and tweaking and learning to live with, with periodic attacks. Wesley Wark, into a new normal now, are we? No, I, th I think there's probably consensus around the table that this is the old normal. Um, and, I, and for me, certainly one of the uh, the best things that came out of, of the tragic events of last week what was just the display of, of remarkable Canadian societal resilience. There was not any panic. There was, with one exception, I think, n no indication of a kind of backlash against the Muslim community. And even in that exception, the, uh, the defacing of a mosque in Cold Lake, Alberta, which is one of the homes of a CF-18 squadron, the community rallied around immediately to clean up the mosque and, sh and show their support. You know, I think this is a terrific sign that, that, that Canadians uh, are, do want to behave and respond in normal fashion when these kinds of attacks, rare though they will be, occur. That said, to come back to our earlier conversation, I, I would still underline the fact that terrorism is a particular kind of scourge. It's not the flu. It's not dying from a road accident. It's a particular kind of scourge, both in a democratic uh, society like ours and, and internationally, and that's why we've designated it a special kind of crime. Terrorism does terrorize Hugh Siegel. It, 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 I mean, he makes a good point. This isn't the flu, is it? <clears throat> no, it's not. And there, but the point about resilience is pretty critical. If you make a substantive change to the core values and underlying balances which maintain our freedom, the score is terrorists one, Canada zero. Terror is, the, terrorist, the purpose of a terrorist is to produce extreme response on the other side. Resilience is to say, you know what? We can't be intimidated. We are going to maintain our core balances. We're going to do our job. We're going to put some more technology in place. We're going to try to make sure that it's not easy for other things to happen that are inappropriate, but the core balances of our society aren't at stake and they're not negotiable. And that's where we should be, I think. Mubin, I, I see a name for it. I, I've never heard it called this before, but I just saw this the other day. Nuisance terrorism. That's what it's called. This notion that we're going to have to put up with one of these nuisance tragedies every now and then. Is that where we're at nowadays? I think so. As uh, the involvement of Canada increases, uh, as uh, as the nature or as the nature of ISIS, as we can see what it is, um, calling for people to attack just anyone and everyone, um, I think you, you, we will see more of these uh, more of these types of attacks. Uh, and I echo the point about being resilient. And I really thank Professor Work for mentioning that point about uh, the Muslim community and uh, the community rallying. That really, really made me feel good. Uh, as a Muslim, as a Canadian, that really, really made me feel good and made a lot of us feel good. So 
we're in this together. Let's 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 keep united. I think. I should just ask you parenthetically because you are the only Muslim on our our program here today. When you heard that the religious affiliation of the two assailants last week was what it was, what's the first thing that went through your head? Please God, don't let it be a Muslim. And here we go again. And here we go again. But uh, you know, the response by Canadians, uh, this is really something for us to be proud of. The rest of the world was watching us. The rest of the world was commenting on how well we had done things. And um, lead by example, that's the best way to be. I want to read something here. Michael Geist, uh, perhaps I can get you to comment on this. This is a, a poll done by the Associated Press this year. 61% of Americans saying that protecting their rights and freedoms was more important to them than making sure they were safe from terrorists. This is 13 years after 9-11, when I'm sure you would have got a very different response 13 years ago. Now, Canadians were polled by the Privacy Commissioner about how comfortable they are with telecommunications companies, for example, giving over private information, the metadata, you know, name, telephone number, addresses to police or intelligence agencies without a warrant. And anywhere from 52 to 60 percent, we're okay with it. So we seem to be, you know, as this needle buffets back and forth, we seem to be more on the side of, we don't mind giving up some of our freedoms now if it potentially means we're going to be safer. What's your view on that? I think that we still haven't had the kind of post-Snowden conversation in this country that we have seen in some other jurisdictions, which I think helps explain to a certain extent why some Canadians may say that they're comfortable with the disclosure of the information, in part because I'm not sure that they're fully aware of both the implications of some of that disclosure and just how widespread some of those practices are. You know, I contrast the kinds of things that we can clearly see with those that we don't. Here in Ottawa, Parliament Hill is open again, and that's something everybody can see. And, and for many people in Ottawa, that's something that we really treasure. It's part of being that kind of open democracy that Canada is all about, so that you can have yoga on the lawn, and people really feel that that openness is critical. And to give that up would be seen as a true loss in the way that Hugh Siegel talked about. The kind of disclosures you just described, the, the subscriber information, the sort of NSA-related surveillance that we see taking place, that's stuff we don't see, and that's stuff we're not often aware of. And so in a sense, I don't know that people can relate to it in quite the same way they can with, quite literally, a lawn in front of Parliament. Let me ask you, though, Hugh Siegel, about a building that you know all too well. They call it the Pink Palace at the top of University Avenue in downtown Toronto. You were chief of staff to former Premier Bill Davis there for many years. When you had that job, anybody at any time could walk into that building and go anywhere. That's right. Nowadays, and, and this has been the case, not since last Sometime, week, but in yeah. fact, yeah, for 20 years at least. It, you can't get past security at the front desk unless you've got a reason for being in that building. And if you want to watch Question Period, you're walking through a metal detector. Right. We've changed already, haven't we? Yes, and that, to be fair, that's been the case on Parliament Hill for some time because over the last three decades, we've had people throwing a quart of blood onto the chamber floor. We've had someone trying to assemble a bomb in a washroom and it blew up in the washroom, thank goodness, not killing anybody other than the prospective assailant. So they have been tightening up on a pretty substantive basis. Um, and um, I think part of the challenge is how do you maintain that access on the one hand and on the other hand keep the people who are making use of that access safe when they're there. Um, you know, uh, to the, to the uh, everlasting credit of the um, sergeant at arms, there would have been a lot of school children and a lot of junior aides from MPs' offices in the Library of Parliament doing their work on a Wednesday morning. If the shooter had gotten into that particular facility, we would have had either a massive hostage taking or something far worse. So the notion that they had to bring him down where they did, I think, is part of how the people who are part of our security apparatus in the Houses of Parliament keep everybody in the Houses of Parliament safe, including the thousands of visitors who come through every week. So again, it's the balance and the challenge. Veronica. I think we should also remember that physical blockages are not not the whole answer. What does um, that mean? As we've heard, Parliament Hill is protected by the RCMP, Parliament Hill Security, the Ottawa Police. There's a lot of jurisdictions. And we know that in a crisis, 
uh, events can overwhelm your protocols. Mm -hmm. So training and practicing and making sure that everybody can move in and out of roles as necessary also becomes important when you're thinking about securing complicated spaces like the downtown of an urban center. I would think, for example, that ministerial drivers, one having been taken out of his car at gunpoint so that the car could be used by the shooter to get up to the center block quickly, because other cars can't get into Parliament unless you have proper, proper certification. Those drivers have the right to ask for some training now to mm -hmm. deal with those kinds of circumstances. Should they be armed? Well, I don't know that, but I think they probably need some training. It's one thing to be trained in defensive driving when you're driving your minister and there's some risk, but it's another thing when you're waiting for your minister and someone decides with a gun to take you out for the purpose of using that car for nefarious purposes, what training does that driver have? My bet is this driver had no training. He reacted appropriately. No one else was killed, to his credit. but. That, that, those are the whole bunch of things governments can do that don't have to change anybody's rights and freedoms that could, in fact, increase our capacity to respond as an organization. Mubin, do we need to arm more people at our places of democracy now in order to... I don't know about arming more people. I do believe in arming the right type of people. Uh, and secondly, uh, uh, target hardening or site hardening. Uh, some aspect of that will be required. If you look at the driveway that goes right up to the front door of the parliament, you could have a panic switch that uh, you know uh, enables a, a, a big metal plate that will block any car from getting past you know three feet. Uh, th that's not expensive. It's very simple. You will need somebody to monitor the grounds at all times. Uh, I hope that kind of level of surveillance or of the uh, of the grounds does happen. Don't forget, you know, Greenpeace uh, not too long ago they unfurled their banner right from the roof of Parliament Hill. Yes. Uh, so it, these are these are unacceptable. These things like it should not be happening. When when I was operational on the Toronto 18 case, they actually thought of this running up and storming the Parliament building. And I thought to myself, I mean that can't be done. Uh, you would think you would think that there would be security. Uh, I mean I was wrong. Uh, well, we're so. not alone in this, right? I mean, if a few people have managed to hop the fence at the White House in Washington <laughs> exactly, and, and, exactly. and shoot bullets no, in the White House for security people, if I may say so, mm -hmm. did a far better job of stopping the alleged assailants before they mm -hmm. penetrated as deeply as was the case in the White House or in the Center for Disease Control, mm -hmm. where an armed individual who was a former prison inmate stood next to the President of the United States in an elevator. That has not happened in Canada, Incredible. nor do I think it ever would. Let's not mm -hmm. wait for it to happen either. We should, uh, prevention is better mm -hmm. than cure. Absolutely. W Wesley Work, we're, we're, uh, I think you described it as an old normal. You don't think this is a new normal. This is an old normal, meaning we've been at this before. But the fact is, we seem to have, I just gave the example of Queen's Park a few moments ago, we seem to have given up some of our civil rights already in terms of unfettered access to these buildings that are at the heart of our democracy. And yet, anybody with a gun who wants to shoot his way in is still going to be able to do that. We're not going to be able to stop that, are we? I'm sure there, there, there are professional ways in which we can um, uh, provide better physical security for the um, for Parliament, for example. You know, I think it has to be understood that there was what I always thought of as a good model that had been erected around uh, security on Parliament Hill, and that model was to, uh, you know, keep uh, the public spaces uh, in front of the Parliament buildings open as much as possible for public access but to essentially try and lock down the parliament buildings in terms of access uh, and circulation themselves. That model failed to some degree with regard to the Wednesday attack, but as, as Hugh, Hugh Siegel said, uh, not all of that gravely at the end of the day. I mean, the response was very, very rapid, and, and the, that rapid response allowed uh, for the prevention of any greater tragedy or, or loss of life. You know, and going, going back a bit further and just broaden this out, I, I think Canadians should understand, and when I say the old normal, I'm really talking about a post-9-11 old normal. We could go further back in time if you like. But, but we debated this issue of what were the appropriate balances or ways to both, you know, um, achieve security, national security, human security, and, and maintain democratic and civil rights. We debated it in the fall of 2001 when the anti-terrorism legislation was passed. And, and I think it would be worthwhile to reflect on the nature of that debate as Parliament moves forward now to debate whatever new legislation the government will bring in. The thing that I remember from that time very strongly, it was the debate was by and large very nonpartisan and very deeply engaged, both in Parliament and, and in the public. And there were some very useful amendments made to the original version of the Anti-Terrorism Act in the course of that debate. I would hope that would be the model for us moving forward, recognizing that we already have a good and workable 
uh, set of uh, uh, arrangements for dealing with security and protecting civil liberties, and let's make sure that we don't do anything rash that destroys that balance. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our time tonight. We thank you for participating in the debate with us on TVO tonight. Michael Geist and Wesley Wark, both of the University of Ottawa, via Skype from the nation's capital. Mubin Sheikh, Veronica Kitchen, Hugh Siegel, here in our studio in Leaside. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.